Welcome to Regulatory Ramblings. Our guest today has a career that's straddled the fences of finance, technology, and regulation. Our guest today is Donald Day of VDX. He was, until recently, with the SFC. And an earlier, the earlier part of our conversation with him, we talked about his time at the SFC, his new company, uh, the regulation of virtual assets, uh, Hong Kong's, the robustness of Hong Kong's regime, and uh, why, why digital assets matter. We're going to pick up on why, uh, why digitalization is important. And uh, Donna, I'd, li I'd like to ask you, I mean, there's, from when I started first covering this as a journalist for Thomson Reuters, uh, I wouldn't say I was the first journalist to cover it, but I was one of the first. But again, as I said to you, the narrative of the last decade was financial crime money laundering. And that was inextricably linked to crypto. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin was, a see was seen intrinsically as a vehicle for money laundering and, and terrorist financing. And, and that stigma hasn't gone away. Now, there, it isn't so much the trade or the transfer of transactions in crypto now they're looking more at the mining, but, but, but that's a whole other discussion. The industry has veered more towards, again, light touch or no regulation because they want an emerging industry to blossom, to reach fruition, Un understandable. The position, and I think people understand this now after the crypto winter of 2022, 2023, and, and all the other scandals that have emerged over the, you know, it's 2009. Crypto is no longer that young. There needs to be a balance. You can't be a de facto member of the financial system without some kind of regulation. So with that in mind, how do you balance the trend to, to digitalization while putting forward sound regulations, but also encouraging innovation? Because the rabid anarcho-libertarian advocates of crypto, and they were much louder a decade or so, 10, 15 years back than they are now, because all the scandals, you know, basically put egg on their face. They say there should be no regulation, and there's still some some cores of that, but uh, but that, that's always balanced, right? Between sound regulation, but not choking off innovation in business. Thank you for that question. F fantastic, and, and you you hit the nail on the head. Um, when you think of the environment under which it was created, the great financial crisis, quantitative easing, that's when Bitcoin was created. And the idea was to create a payment system that is not under control of any, any central entity. There's no central bank that can print money or play with interest rates. Um, and one of the goals was disintermediation. And now we're talking about all these intermediaries coming to play. But as you said, um, the whole history of failed institutions, probably starting with Mount Gox, not, not the first one, but the most prominent, and then leading up to FTX last year, has shown that you need intermediaries, at least for the on-ramp of, of fiat to, to crypto. Um, you need intermediaries to provide products and services. And these need to be regulated because as soon as you manage clients' money, you need to adhere to certain regulation. And it's very interesting because in the past weeks and months, I've had many conversations with um, people who come to this asset class, who weren't in the asset class maybe a year or two ago. These really are seasoned professionals out of traditional finance who see an opportunity. They want to be part of this. They see the promises and, and potential of the asset class. But they come with a very, very different mindset than your, your anarchists or evangelists have. And to them, it's very, very clear. You need regulation to bring in institutional money. A hedge fund manager, an asset manager, an insurance company will not even entertain a conversation with you unless you can show your license and regulate it. Um, we also need. Is that not dangerous when you've got insurance companies dabbling in this? Good point. 
So insurance companies need to generate a certain amount of yield, don't they? Because they need to be able to pay out the premiums. So insurance companies... They're interested in the appreciation, which they'll then convert back into fiat currency, which will pay their, pre which will pay their policies and their shareholders. Sure. Um, but if... And if, if you have... But it's such a speculative asset and it's non-traditional, sure. so sure. should they be in it? Sure. So, correct. So let's think a step further. If you, in an institutional manner, you introduce the tools that institutions need, for example, for, for risk management. So you were talking about uh, plain vanilla options, put call, futures forwards, swaps. Um, the basics at this point. Very basic. Very basic, but a toolkit to manage risk. And we're not talking about ridiculous 50 times leverage or even 100 times leverage. We're talking about proper risk management. Um, even the most seasoned traders I've seen uh, who do this professionally wouldn't go beyond five or six times leverage. So you provide this to an insurance company, a traditional portfolio manager, asset manager, and they might come up with a strategy that is actually an options strategy, a very traditional volatility strategy. Um, they are able to generate 6 8% yield per year. That's great. That's enough. And now we've abstracted away from crypto. We've abstracted away from how do you do custody? How do you protect your private key? Do you have enough randomness when you create your private key? How do you do custody? What do you do if you lose a private key? We're talking about a completely different field now. And this is how I think we need to engage with institutional asset class. Now, you mentioned some very interesting points. Um, I firmly believe that regulation doesn't really stifle, inhibit, or even kill innovation. So regulation really is not only necessary, but is going to be the key enabler of this asset class and is going to be the future of this asset class. Because when we have a stable regulatory framework, and many jurisdictions in this world, Hong Kong isn't the only one, of course, are working towards that and is establishing that. That will lead to um, institutional adoption and that will lead us out of the current bear market. So... You're right, digitalization is here and it affects many different areas of our lives. And that is also something that is above and beyond the pure trading of cryptocurrencies because the technology itself isn't yet applied to its full opportunity or its full extent. And there's many different areas in our lives that are above and beyond just financial markets where this technology will make a big difference. Oh, certainly. Certainly, I mean, in terms of one of the simulations I've seen is that uh, you might, if the hospital authority were fully utilized the DLT technology, you, you may well see fewer mistakes made. Absolutely. Of course, any any you no know, system is uh, infallible so long as people are part of it. Uh, and some of my professors in law school used to say, "There's nothing is foolproof to a sufficiently talented fool." <laughs> <laughs> but but let's take that example. There's a fantastic example. So obviously, uh, let's say your medical records and and your current results of a current doctor's visits are in some form codified on some form of blockchain. Yeah, right. let's take um, COVID vaccination records. Yeah, yeah. For, for example. Yeah. Now, you obviously would need regulation around who is able to create that, who is able to modify it if, if you get another vaccination. And... Who's able to see it, such as insurers. Or... Exactly. Yeah. So if that was a free fall and there would be... Um, bad actors involved, that's not something that anybody would want. So that's a very good example of why we need regulation around it and why regulation really sets the framework in, in which to operate. No, good, good point. There are, there are multiple uses of that technology. So something you've shared in the past with us is that 
you think Hong Kong is ahead of Singapore and Dubai as a fintech and digital asset hub. Um, could could you elaborate on that? That is is it just Singapore is a common law jurisdiction, so are we. A lot of money is flowing there. They when they put their minds to something, they get it done. But again, that's because the state driven approach, which by comparison makes Hong Kong look lazy and falling behind? Or is it the case that access to the China market trumps everything? Thank you for the question. One of my favorite topics. Um, and surely, one of the areas where Singapore is ahead and doing really well is marketing. Because they're able to pull together um, the government, the regulator, the markets, and go on roadshows almost across the world to promote Singapore. But no one's been approved and everyone's on provisional, so... Sure. Yeah. Sure. They get the waiver permits, but it doesn't instill, again, what we were saying about that, that sense of stability and, 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 and confidence. Um, and the feeling is right now that doesn't exist in Asia, that crypto cash of questionable provenance, uh, and not, this isn't just me, all representative parties have said this, is flooding to the UAE, it's flooding to Dubai. Mm -hmm. So is that not a signal, are markets not telling us something? Well, so in 2019, like I said, there was a lot of criticism for the Hong, to the Hong Kong regulator about the framework. Um, we've seen how that played out, not unexpectedly so, that um, low-touch jurisdictions faced the brunt of the failures in the past 12 and 18 months. So Hong Kong really has established itself as the center for, of stability and accountability as well. Um, again, if now people leave a jurisdiction and go to another one where they feel there's less regulation, it beckons the question, what kind of market participants are these? And are they going to be able to engage with institutional investors, banks, um, brokerages? And I doubt so. And I fear that what we've seen play out over the past 12, 18 months will repeat itself. Because when you look at the, let's say, the last 100 years of what happened in equities, what happened in commodities, what happened in FX, what happened in credit, it's almost like um, an up and down. Um, there's cycle theory that things keep on repeating themselves, events repeat themselves. And what we've seen during the great financial crisis, largely caused by real estate slash credit slash CDOs and CDOs squared and cubed and so on. That was just another permutation of things that happened 15, 20 years before and before that and before that. And we had crisis in 1912 and crisis in 1920 and so on and so forth. So everything's variation on a theme. Yes. It's just, just a new asset class. Um, so therefore, most jurisdictions, top tier jurisdictions like the UK, Switzerland, Europe, the US, really take the approach of we need solid regulation, solid rules by which to play. And these, by, by large degree, are the same rules to abide in, in, in other asset classes. If I'm a credit trader, I have to adhere to a lot of rules. It's the same as, as, as in, in digital assets. That's something that isn't really stressed, because when you're a student, to make your life easy, you study things in a discreet manner, in isolation, in a compartmentalized fashion. And you, you don't see the interconnectedness between different fields. Um, and I, I don't know if that's deliberately done, but then when you get older, and, and you, you start to see, okay, but... People are, you know, people may, again, you study securities regulation, you study futures regulation, and you study in the U.S., you see the acts written about the same time with the same language. 
it's only with the passage of time, maturity, and a sense of discernment that you develop, get a sense of how the world works, that you start to say, okay, people are playing games on the future side to affect the present stock price, or, or vice versa. So that that really do, doesn't sink in, but the, I think that that needs to be that needs to be emphasized. You've also shared that it's more meaningful to talk about virtual uh, digital assets rather than cryptocurrencies or virtual assets or digital commodities. People use those terms interchangeably. Why, why, why the more expansive term? Mm. I think the real opportunity is in digital assets, and that encompasses, includes cryptocurrencies, but is a lot more. So when you look at cryptocurrencies, varies every day, but we have about twelve to 14,000 different coins and tokens out there. Most of them are borderline meaningless. Um, recently attended a, a conference at Bloomberg and they start with about a thousand and they filter out until they're about 50 coins. That's probably right. Um, and even, of any meaning or value? Yes, yes. And those are the ones they look at um, to produce their index and those are the ones that they show uh, in, in their terminal if, if people look at it. Um, even then you might struggle to really find a use case for every single one of those. Of course, there's white, white papers, and of course, there's interesting protocols and teams behind some of them, at least. But often, protocols and, and solutions that I see are looking for a problem to solve. There's no problem that they're actually solving. One. Two, quite often, it's not clear how they will ever commercialize it, how they will ever make money. And that's that's a key, right? Any entity needs to make money. It needs to be commercialized. Now, why digital assets? Um, <clears throat> there are indeed in this world areas where there is a problem. So often price finding is not very transparent or there might be very little liquidity in the market. So let me give you an example. Let's assume you owned a property on Bali. Let's assume, for whatever reason, you needed liquidity. Now, the only option today you have is you can sell it. Well, of course, you can rent it out via Airbnb, but if you want to sell it, the price finding of a property in Bali isn't fairly, very transparent and you would probably only be able to sell it to someone who is actually on Bali or using a property agent on Bali to purchase that property. However, if you were able to say, let's take the next 10 years of income stream out of that property, you're able to tokenize that income stream and you're able to list that token on a platform. Now, what you're doing is you're not relinquishing of the title or ownership of that property, at least 10 years plus, but you're getting immediate liquidity. The second part, what you're solving for is you're enabling investors who don't necessarily usually have access to an income like that. Um, an income that probably would be yielding anywhere between 8 and 12%. So if you have an 8 to 12% yielding investment that is completely uncorrelated to the market, it doesn't matter whether the Hang Seng goes up or down, um, you have really solved the problem because a lot of people would be very happy you with... You've created your own market. Yes. And you've given access to this uncorrelated... Let's make it in the middle, 10% yielding investment. And there might be an investor who sits in somewhere in Latin America, for example, who will be very happy to have access to uncorrelated asset, retail-based asset, um, yielding 10%. So you're solving two problems, right? You're solving your immediate liquidity issue, and you're solving for an investor who gets access to a uncorrelated yielding asset. And this is what we talked about earlier, 
you're really fixing a problem, you're addressing a problem. Now, this has nothing to do with any cryptocurrency per se. This is taking a real world asset, tokenizing in the same way you could create an, an SPV or you could, you could list it in some form, but cheaper, quicker, more accessible, um, and creating a market out of that. And that's what I think where the real opportunity lies. The purest long ghost, I mean, this is not going to debate, should, should crypto and digital assets even be viewed as part and parcel of fintech? Some would say yes, some would say no. Some would say it is one of the pillars of fintech. It's an important pillar of fintech and it shouldn't be overlooked. But the fintech discussion is, is far broader. Financial technology has actually been around for a very long time. If we look back, well, I mean, my, my former employer, Thomson Reuters, okay. enabling uh, farmers to send uh, orders for, you know, agricultural contracts by telegram. Absolutely. In the 19th century. That was the fintech of its day. Of course, then there's the distinction between those old-fashioned forward contracts and, you know, futures contracts and that the former are, the former entail actual physical delivery of the commodity in, 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 in question. I'll give you one more example. Um, so I started my career, as you correctly pointed out, with Accenture. Our client was Deutsche Börse, which has a spot market called Citra and a derivatives market called Eurix. And at that time, um, one of the largest, not the largest um, fixed income futures contract is um, a contract on, on a German government bond called the Bund Future. And, and the life in London had a very strong hold of that. Trading in the Bund Future was happening almost exclusively in London. I remember, it was, it was the mid-2000s. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So our client wanted to get that back. So they over multiple years, got an electronic trading system delivered by Accenture and designed and delivered by Accenture um, that was fully automated. What they then, what that enabled them to do is to say, okay, the next six months, no fees. Trading, no fees. Life couldn't compete with that. They were still doing an open outcry market. They had to pay the people, right? They could not say no fees. Guess what? After six months, almost 98% of the volume in the Bund future was back uh, in Frankfurt on the electronic trading system. And that, of course, is sticky. Once the liquidity is there, it's sticky. And then you can reintroduce fees and people will still stay there and trade with you. And that's a very good example, like your example, with what your former employer, Thomson Reuters, did of applying financial technology, solving a real problem and making people's lives better, cheaper, faster. Next question goes to the, well, this will be of interest to the AML and financial crime compliance crowd. So on February 20th of this year, the SOC published its consultation paper on the proposed regulatory requirements for virtual asset trading platform operators, the ATPs, that it licensed. The paper delineated the regulators' views and proposals on requirements for VATPs to be regulated in the new licensing regime for virtual asset service providers, VASPs, one of the acronyms of this space, under the Anti-Money Laundering and Counterterrorism Financing Ordinance, AMLO, which was originally passed in 2011-2012, amended in recent years, Chapter 615 of the Laws of Hong Kong, as well as under the Treatment of VATPs regulated under the existing licensing regime, Securities and Futures Ordinance, the SFO. So why is this happening now and what will it mean for compliance and legal staff at financial institutions when the VASP regime becomes effective on June 1st? So, yeah, that's the perennial question. What does it mean to compliance? And so the current framework as you correctly pointed out, the VATP framework was, since it was launched, has been a voluntary framework. So people can volunteer to become licensed under this framework. Why would you do so? Again, to be able to interact with institutional investors. Um, now, 
there's obviously the recognition with a regulator that there are other entities that are conducting their business in Hong Kong or to the Hong Kong public that aren't licensed and regulated. At uh, this point, maybe to point out, because there's sometimes a misconception in the market where people think the regulator doesn't really know what's going on. And having worked there, I can wholeheartedly say the regulator knows exactly what is going on. Uh, they just choose when, when to act. So the recognition of that was that something had to be done. There's also requirements under FATF, for example, there's the travel rule that needs to be implemented. And it was, I would say, unsatisfactory to have people who conduct large sizes, large volumes of trades in Hong Kong that are unlicensed. And there's also the consideration of money laundering and how to prevent it and at least how to act when it occurs and to be able to, to freeze accounts and assets and so on and so forth. Um, which then led to the development to require licensing under the AMLO. So what does that mean as of the 1st of June this year? It's very soon. Um, if you are a platform that is not yet operational in Hong Kong, then you cannot start your business without a license. If you are a pre-existing platform in Hong Kong that's already operational, you then have sort of like a grace period during which you can continue to operate, but you need to prepare and file your application to become licensed. And then afterwards, you're deemed while the application is being processed and you're asked a lot of questions and so on, then you're deemed to be licensed. You can still continue your business. The, the main difference here is that this is no longer voluntary. It's no longer optional to be licensed or not. You have to apply for license. You must get licensed or you must seize your business. What does it mean to ask you, answer your question for compliance people? Um, there will be, so what is the obvious effect? More work. Sure. <laughs> um, the obvious effect is going to be there are a number of entities in Hong Kong that are now going to apply for license, uh, for a license. There are other entities who will look at this maybe underestimate the amount of effort it takes to obtain a license and he who will decide that that's not what they want to do and they will leave Hong Kong. There are indeed quite a lot of entities who are actually actively looking at this and are now coming to Hong Kong to be licensed under this regime. This will lead to more demand for seasoned and experienced compliance professionals and also demand for people who can qualify as a responsible officer, for example. Well, we're, 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 see, we're seeing the ads. I mean, many, many would say it's about time. When, when, you, when you think about, there are instances where oftentimes it takes a while for Hong Kong to take action. Like for, when you consider how many years, how many years insider trading was not a crime. Um, for how many years were money changers and remittance agency remittance firms uh, next to nothing was asked about asked of them from an AML standpoint? Really, nine eleven shocked the world into acting in the Patriot Act. But what should I mean? We have students in our JD and LLB programs, a number of whom envision careers in compliance. We have those that are more focused, in many cases, mid-career professionals in our LLM program in uh, compliance and regulation. And um, then, of course, there are those that are already professionals who need to bone up. They need to study about the new subject matter because... Compli uh, crypto compliance officers are a new thing, but presumably you you know they want people with compliance backgrounds who will be brought up to speed on on, on crypto. So with, with with that in mind, what 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 should they learn? How should they learn? What what should they? 
how, how best should they prepare for a compliance environment in which digital assets are going to be a growing part or at the very least a perennial part of, of what they will encounter? I really like that you say compliance professionals who then go into crypto rather the other way around. So I think that's a very important distinction. Because the job description, I mean, an older person may look at that and say, I'm too old for this. I, I, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Younger people may say, okay, fine. It's just something new to learn. I'm, I'm up to that challenge. Uh, I, th I, th I think older people, older compliance professionals do have something to offer. And it's, it's that window of experience, that, that, that span of time, that historical perspective that uh, we shouldn't give short shrift to. But um, the, the joke is everyone wants a 30-year-old with 20 years of experience. Youth is, youth is still highly prized. And because the technological nature of this, rightly or wrongly, there's a presumption Older folks aren't hip, aren't that hip to it. They're they're not that tech savvy. Sure, I fully agree. But then, people don't change, so the experience of compliance people is invaluable. Let me take one example. We talked about KYC already. Um, market surveillance, very important topic. Um, the alerts that you parameterize in a market surveillance system are no different to any other trading system. Whether you trade dollar yen or you trade a stock or you trade a cryptocurrency, if you engage in any market manipulative activity, it doesn't really matter what it is that you trade in. So maybe the parameters are slightly different. Maybe you set it up differently. Maybe the execution is a bit different, but the activity itself is no different. The second part is when you engage with, when you build a compliance team, you want to have that experience. You want to have that gravitas. You want to have the experience of how things have been handled before, what you have seen in real life before rather than just theoretically. Also, when you engage with people like regulators, if it comes to that with law enforcement or even with clients, you want to show that you have the experience. So I fully agree with the notion of having people who have a lot of experience in this field, in compliance, and then apply it to digital assets. Now, what can people do to prepare? First of all, right off, I would say, read the consultation paper. It's 300, 362 pages, so it's fairly long, but it, com it contains the whole AMLO. So read that, and that will show people what they don't know. They will read terms that they don't know. They will read a paragraph they completely don't understand. So do some research on that. The revised AML, AML right? Well, the yeah. whole consultation paper is, first of all, a summary. Then um, the previous terms and conditions that now will become guidelines and they're modified. So some, uh, th there's some changes there. Um, and then suggested changes to the AMLO specifically for, for uh, digital assets, virtual assets. So read that, try to understand it, go through it, read up if you don't understand it. And then along what you said, get real life experience in a compliance function. And, and there's many out there. You could be working for, for, for a, a law firm. You could be working in a compliance function in a traditional financial field. Or indeed, why not? start your career in a licensed and regulated digital asset business. So the emphasis here is licensed and regulated. So you get that experience of being answerable to a regulator. And often the compliance function is the main function that interacts with a regulator. Usually the regulator would at least initially contact someone in the compliance department for any questions they might have. So that's probably a very good set of experience right, right there. Uh, you've been very active with the local chapter of CIFAR, and I know for the longest time asset recovery has been a very uh, lucrative field. Uh, 
Hunk HKU Space um, teaches, I think, a certificate program that um, a friend of mine used to teach in, in this field. Any new developments you'd like to share with us about the group, since the group's formation last summer, which was about a year after the UK chapter was created in London? So what, what, what can you tell us about what, what's happening at CIFAR locally? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, so I'm one of the co-founding members. And when we set this up, it was very, very interesting because it was at a time that was very difficult globally. We were in the middle of COVID still. And also for Hong Kong, a lot of people at the time were deciding to leave Hong Kong. Um, there was a lot of uh, negative connotations in, in press and media about Hong Kong and its future. And us getting together and saying we're willing to spend a substantial amount of our spare and free time in a non-for-profit manner to to build this up, build CIFA up in Hong Kong was very promising for Hong Kong because this is one of the building blocks you need to further bring the digital asset class into an institutional framework. You need, unfortunately, but it's one of the tools you need, you need to enable legal professionals, including judges, to understand what tools are available in case of fraud. So how can you prevent fraud? But you can't prevent all fraud, as we all know. The instruments that are available in other asset classes, especially fiat currencies, are also equities, stocks, and, and bonds are very well understood and can be exercised very fast. But just in case there's a fraud detected involving a cryptocurrency and a lawyer apl applies to a judge to, to, to get uh, an account frozen, well, what does that mean? How do you freeze an account? How do you freeze an address? Because it's peer-to-peer. -peer. How do you explain this to a judge? Does the judge actually understand what he's going to write and, and issue? So our aim really, there's three... Can you get a Moravia injunction against for crypto? Well, that's exactly what we're work, working around. Mm -hmm. How, what does an injunction mean in crypto, right? Against whom? How do you deliver that? How do you ensure that the entity, let's say it's a trading platform, how do you make sure they understand what the injunction is? Let's, let's make sure that they understand they need to comply with it. Um, how do we generate the awareness of the market participants involved that this is something that is very important. This is something that they need to um, have tools in place to ideally prevent, but at least very quickly detect and then follow up. So the three main goals, engaging, enhancing, and educating. So engaging with the industry, engaging with the regulators, engaging with the legal system. Enhance, we want to bring best practices, how, how, intermediaries, how market participants can set up their operation, their processes, their procedures, the training of their employees to be aware of what to do, and, and also education, um, publish this information. So we've been quite active. We had a, a, a very good launch event, um, over 100 people attended and very high quality people, in very, very good discussions all round. And um, we had a media roundtable where we discussed certain topics. And we have a lot of... Remember Jonathan Crompton was telling us about that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so, so he's the, the main co-founder, if you will. He, he brought the idea back to Hong Kong. And the next steps are we want to engage with someone senior from the regulator or from the government. And we have a few other events planned where we... Put, uh, we want to introduce people to the tools available, for example, and maybe showcase the strength of uh, different tools. Because it's very interesting. Some people believe that because cryptocurrencies are supposed to be anonymous, that they lend themselves well to illegal transactions. But there have been quite a few cases where law enforcement agencies were able to apprehend criminals, partly based on the information that is available on a blockchain. So it is indeed possible to an astonishing degree to gain information out of 
um, blockchain transactions. So these are some of the things we want to bring to attention and make sure that people understand. I've done quite a few presentations to law firms in Hong Kong as well, just to make people understand this is coming and you as a lawyer, you will have cases and you will have clients coming to you. And this is what is available in the industry. These are some people you can talk to and this is what you need to look out for. Do, do investigations, do, do, does asset tracing and recovery differ when you're dealing with crypto and digital versus other types of assets such as for fiat currency? The answer is yes and no. Um, so I was, on, I was, I mean, because I was once told that um, investigations for AML versus investigations for politically exposed persons and, and bribery and corruption are that different. Fully agree with that. So, um, as part of our application or any application in this field, you need to. Um, it's so just in one, you're looking at the asset, the, the, for the funds. In the other, you're looking for the person. Well, exactly. So, um, know your client, KYC, in digital assets is no different to know your clients for a bank or for a broker. If you open an account with a Hong Kong broker, they will conduct due diligence and know your client procedures on you as a potential client. The same applies to digital assets, of course. You don't change as a person just because you open an account with a digital asset broker versus a stock broker. Um, the tracing of assets is, of course, different. It's a difference if you say, um, my money was stolen from my account, and in this case, the police force or the JFIU goes and traces that money through different accounts. And if needed, freeze them quite quickly. Um, of course, in the blockchain is quite different. Um, you can trace it. Then there's the issue of, for example, tumblers that people use to obfuscate. There's ways around that as well. So you can quantitatively still run statistics on tumblers. Um, then people go to other exchanges, might transfer to a privacy coin that is also built to obfuscate. So there is a lot of technical complications, but I think people underestimate what the tools that are available today to legal and law enforcement agencies can actually do. In the time we've got left, is, is there anything you'd like to share with us? Anything you feel we haven't discussed? Anything you'd like to share with our, with our audience? I th I'm very proud of what Hong Kong has achieved. And I, I really say this not because I, I want to talk anyone's book, but because a lot of people took a lot of, to my mind, unfair criticism uh, about the hard work they put in place to create a good, stable and uh, regulatory framework. Um, it's very encouraging to see the speeches by Paul Chan, Julia Leung at the FinTech Week last week, uh, last year, the very recent speeches they have done, the consultation that the, you've mentioned from the SFC that just closed and the potential expansion of the regulatory regime. It's extremely encouraging to see all the participants, especially in the last two weeks, we have um, about five, six events every day at least in, in this past two weeks. Um, and the participants are, are, are very eager and these are, by and large, really high quality people. Now, we're not talking about people pushing some dodgy projects or shady businesses. These are seasoned professionals who are eager to get into, into this asset class in Hong Kong. And that's incredibly encouraging. Well, Donald Day, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And to our audience, thank you again. Until next time.